This week, we're joined by Matthew Gorge, the CEO of Vigitrust, who's here to talk to us about why multi-regulation security frameworks make sense for CISOs. In our segment, second segment, we'll cover the security and compliance news of the week, including a $2.2 million HIPAA settlement, 4 million stolen credit cards linked to four restaurant chains, Facebook says data is complicated, and more. So join us as we tear down silos and build bridges on Security and Compliance Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. And now, it's the show that bridges the requirements of regulations, compliance, and privacy with those of security. Your trusted source for complying with various mandates, building effective programs, and current compliance news. It's time for Security and Compliance Weekly. Today's organizations face an evolving set of security threats and continually changing compliance requirements. As your business grows, privacy concerns only multiply and add to a dynamic set of priorities. Today's organizations need to integrate risk, security, and privacy into a cohesive program. Online Business Systems team of seasoned security practitioners work closely with you to assess your security posture, policies, procedures, and technologies providing tailored solutions that are specifically aligned to your business's risk profile and ultimately ensure the protection of your brand. To learn more about online business systems, go to securityweekly.com forward slash online. Welcome to episode nine of Security and Compliance Weekly. We're recording on, I can't believe it's December already, 3rd, 2019. I'm your host, Mr. Jeff Mann, coming to you from sunny Pasadena, Maryland. And joining me online today are my co-hosts, Scott Lyons and Josh you're not in your usual spot, Marpet. Hey guys. What can I say? I got snowed in over Thanksgiving. Nice. Good good place to be, I hope. And not so yeah, my dad's you don't... not a bad place at all. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, today we're gonna to be talking to uh, our guest Matthew Gorge, but before that I have a couple announcements. Uh, first, if you're planning on attending the RSA conference next year, which is on February 24th through 28th, uh, we encourage you to register early to take uh, advantage of their early registration. You can save $900 off a full conference pass if you register before January 24th. And as an extra bonus, if you go to securityweekly.com slash RSAC, that's Romeo Sierra Alpha Charlie 2020, and we have a special discount code you can use to register and receive an extra $150 off. Also, mark your calendars. It's coming up quicker than we think. It's December 19th will be our Security Weekly Holiday Extravaganza, where we're going to be live streaming not one, not two, not three, but five one-hour panel discussions with some of the most knowledgeable professionals in our industry on topics such as DevOps, blue team tactics, security history and its role, and of course, security and compliance. Also to round out the evening, Ed Scotus will be joining the Security Weekly host to give his annual announcement about the CounterHack Holiday Hack Challenge. You can view the live stream all day on our YouTube channel or by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash live. So we hope to see you there. All right, enough of that. Our guest today is Matthew Gorge, the CEO of a company called Vigitrust. I met Matthew, I don't know how many years ago, at the annual PCI community meeting, and we basically catch up every year uh, at the community meeting. This past year, which was up in Vancouver, I mentioned to him that we were starting up this, uh, this new webcast podcast and invited him to join our conversation, to which he obliged. So, Matthew, welcome to Security and Compliance Weekly. Thanks very much, Jeff. How are you? Doing very well, thank you. Hey, uh, to start off, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, like how you how you got involved in the the security slash compliance industry. Yeah, so I've been involved in the, the security and compliance industry for about twenty years. Uh, as you can hear from my accent, I'm French. I've been living in Ireland for about twenty years, and in fact, twenty four years. And um, I got into security very quickly into network security. And I kind of developed a passion for information governance, data security, as one does. 
And over the years, I've been involved as a project manager, sales manager, sales director for various companies. And I started VG Trust about 16, 17 years ago, um, initially de delivering uh, pre-assessment work in terms of security assessment against data protection, PCI, that type of stuff. A lot of training. And about five years ago, VG Trust completely pivoted into um, a software as a service solution around integrated risk management. The idea is really to demystify how you manage a, a governance program. So it's uh, aimed at operational people, but mostly um, C-level folks, CISOs, um, risk managers, risk professionals that are struggling with multiple and often com conflicting regulations and, and, and standards. Um, so we're headquartered in Dublin, in Ireland. We have a support office in uh, in New York and a sales office in, in Paris. Clients in 120 countries, award-winning company. Uh, it's been a very interesting ride and the, the industry has changed a lot. And indeed, we do catch up um, every year at PCI meetings and sometimes at the RSA conference. And it's uh, it's been a very interesting industry and it keeps evolving uh, this year is very interesting as well with a, a lot of consolidation work with, within the privacy sector. So uh, I'm also looking forward to 2020. I think we're, go we're going to enjoy it. That's great. So one of the questions we're trying to ask everybody that we interview on this show in particular is uh, – uh, you know, given the, the genesis of this show being trying to sort of bridge the gap that exists between the security world and the compliance world, uh, just want to ask you sort of an open-ended question of where, where do you fall on the what we're calling the security versus compliance spectrum? Sort of open-ended question, but, you know, basically what are your thoughts about security and compliance and, and where they, they, they mix, they don't mix, they, 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 they coalesce or whatever? Yeah, so I always say that security is a journey, not a destination. So you're never really reaching the, the end destination per se when you want to be secure. Um, and so you've got a, a few pit stops along the way, and those pit stops are generally compliance pit stops, right? So you've put in the right technical solutions in place, you've put in the right, the, the right policies and procedures in place, you've trained the right people the right way, and at some stage, at a given point in time, you're actually in compliance with regulation one, two, three, or with uh, framework X, Y, Z. But that doesn't mean you're actually secure. So uh, it's an ongoing journey. And, you know, we, we see different industries um, within the security community talking about business as usual. That's for PCI. Others in the ISO world talk about continuous compliance. At, at the end of the day, it's making sure that at any given time, you've got the right levels of uh, technical, operational, and people security that essentially um, mean to the regulator or to the enforcement body that you've you, you've done what was possible for you to do in order to protect the data and the systems you needed to protect, but that still doesn't mean that you're one hundred percent secure. If that makes sense. Well, it somewhat makes sense, but that's certainly something we can discuss. But uh, as a segue, uh, you know, you had suggested the topic of. Uh, how do CISOs uh, work with, make sense of, or why they do make sense, this idea of multiple regulatory or security frameworks. So so what what is it that you want to share with us today on that topic? Yeah, so, um, you know, if you take a, a large organization, wherever they're based in the world, but let's say we take um, a health system in, in the U.S., for instance, they will need to comply with uh, state PII, with federal PII. They'll need to comply with HIPAA. They'll need to comply with PCI. If they've got uh, data um, from Europe, they'll need to comply with GDPR. Now they need to comply with CCP different programs to comply with one set or maybe several regulations or frameworks at the same time. And one of the issues that, that they have is they keep uh, reinventing the wheel on an ongoing basis. And in fact, they may also have different um, different groups doing, doing different um, within security. And, and sometimes 
do, doing things that, that conflict, right? So one organization are encrypting using one level of encryption, another one might be using a different level of encryption, some might be using uh, different data classification tools and so on. And, and one of the, the key challenges for an organization is to have um, an overarching simple framework um, that will dial back to all of the various regulations and standards we need to be in, compli in compliance with. And so what, what we've done at VG Trust is we've looked at a, um, a simple framework that we call the five pillars of security. Um, and the idea is that whether you look at PCI, HIPAA, uh, FISMA, NERC, FERC, and CIP, anything, in, any type of, of, uh, of regulation or standards, uh, a framework that deals with information governance, data security, people security, you, you always end up dialing back to, to five key areas, five common denominators that anybody can understand, especially at sea level and board level. Um, so think of um, uh, a board meeting where um, the agenda is, is security. Uh, the, I don't know, the company might have heard that they're, they're uh, their closest competitors got breached and suddenly they call an emergency board meeting and say, hey, could, this, that, could that happen to us? Um, the challenge you're going to have is that you're going to have a mix of legal people, operational people, business people that don't necessarily understand what they need to comply with. They don't necessarily understand the, the, the ramifications for themselves and for the company. And in fact, some board members add um, different value um, or different sets of values to, to, to the organization and may not fully understand how the organization is, is structured. So we dial back to those five key areas, and namely people security, physical security, data security, infrastructure security, which is your wider infrastructure. So your networks behind firewalls, your, your subsidiaries, your franchisees, your third parties, your fourth parties, your application security, security, your remote workers, and then crisis management, what do you do when something goes wrong? And so the whole point of having a, a simple system in plain English is that all of the various stakeholders at various levels within the organization, right from the factory floor up to the board, um, can speak the same language and understand the security challenge um, in a, in a common framework. And that's really, I think, what, what what's missing in, in, in many organizations. And in fact, if you look at some of the latest breaches that have been well documented, like the Equifax breach, for instance, um, you'll find that the CEO, the CIO, and the CSO weren't really aligned, um, probably didn't have the same set of skills. And you can imagine that at, 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 a, at a C level meeting, some stuff probably got lost in translation, probably because of a lack of a common framework and common language. Matthew, uh, Josh Marpet here. Uh, I've got to ask, I, I see your five categories, your five pillars. You've got people, physical, data, crisis management, and then the one I have a question about, which you call infrastructure. Um, when you say infrastructure, you said networks, subsidiaries, third parties, AppSec, application security, remote workers. That's bunching together too many things. I'm sorry, but I, I disagree. I, I've got to talk to you about this. I, you know, I'm quite happy to prove you wrong. That's okay. <laughs> but um, <laughs> you can't, but that's okay. Know, Let's talk. Um, you know, the way I look at it is you, you need to be able to, to use language that anybody will understand. Right. So uh, I, I do appreciate that there's, there's, there's a good few things within that pillar. Right. Um, but equally, I would prefer to have um, a, a generic term like infrastructure security, because most people will understand the idea of having a structure and having different silos working together and so on. Because if I start to break it down too much, I'm going to lose the, 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 the impact of, of consolidating everything. So, I mean, you know. And the, that I, the, I agree the, with the you entirely on that part. I, I, I'm 100% on board with you there. Keep it simple, stupid, the KISS principle, because otherwise you'll start losing people. We're on the same page there, and I'm good with that. Okay? Um, my question is really about third parties. When you say third parties, I don't see those as infrastructure. That, I guess, is the part that I really want to talk to you about. 
Yeah, so it's a good it's a good point. Um, uh, potentially, that one is debatable. My my view is that if you look at the risk surface of an enterprise, um, and you look at all the vendors that are using the cloud providers, the third parties that that they use for whatever service or good daily business, I see that as part of the infrastructure because essentially those organizations will have access to people, data, systems, or a mix of that. And they kind of become part of your infrastructure. They, 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 they might be independent units. They might even be different legal units. Hmm. They may not even be fully part of your group, or they might be a franchise that's operating under different uh, operational agreements. That said, they essentially become an extension of your business. So you're, you're, you're abstracting uh, them into a, a, you know, a in my view, in your business. I'm sorry. Can I'm you sorry. That? You're, you're abstracting them into a workflow of your business. So you're saying this third party is a, is a segment in this workflow in this flow chart. And uh, that's how you're calling it infrastructure. Am I understanding that correctly? Yeah, that, that, that's correct. Yeah. I mean, you okay. could decide to, to you could decide to leave them out. And, and just have them, um, you know, dealt with under a different pillar if you wanted to. If you do that, I think there's a risk in doing that because um, when, when you go about complying, say, with PCI, for instance, you know, you look at requirement 12.8 and you look at 12.9 and so on, they, they actually look at third parties being linked to your infrastructure and therefore being in scope. So... To some oh, extent, and, and, it's part of and the, I agree with you there. But when you look at NIST CSF, they have supply chain risk management as a fully separate piece uh, of the risk management uh, of a paradigm. That, so, that is uh, totally, yeah, that's totally correct. But the, the model is actually built for key decision makers and for board level folks, right? Who probably will never have heard of NIST and probably, in fact, will never have heard of, of, of PII per se. So we're trying to dumb it down in a way that uh, you can educate the board and you can essentially get them to sponsor any type of security and compliance program. And in order to do that, you need to demystify those terms. Uh, in order to demystify that, you need to keep it strategic or even super strategic. Uh, in and fact, when we look well at the, and the five sorry, okay, uh, sorry, no, I was just going to add that when when we look at our five pillars of, of security framework, we have two versions of it. One is where you, you have super strategic questions, like five questions with 12, you can, you can start being more granular. And each organization might decide then at that stage in, in, in your case, uh, in, in the case of the, the point that you brought up, that maybe third party risk management needs to be taken separately. Um, but but the, the, the challenge is to get them on board, you know, ask them very strategic questions. As a board, That's... are we satisfied that we've got the right levels of, of physical security? So in other words, we're not going to be in the headlines because somebody was able to walk into the, the, the front door, walk to the server room, and, and pick up a machine from there, right? So it's at that level. Um, and you'd be no, surprised, you know, you'd be surprised the answers we get to those questions. Oh, no, 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 trust me, I would not. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, I, I um, think, I like, the, I like the idea that you, you're trying to simplify. I, 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 that works with sort of my worldview consulting world worldview i guess you could put it like that and there's always a risk when you simplify that you're sort of tr trampling over the technical accur accuracy of things which mm -hmm. uh you know when i when i'm trying to teach my uh, jedi mind trick effective communication course that's one of the points that i bring up is you know it's simp simplification is something you want to do and don't get so hung up on the fact that you may not be completely technically accurate in in the way that you're oversimplifying, but do it in such a way that it works for your audience, which I think is what you're describing. But 
uh, knowing full well that, you know, the analogy or, or, you know, forcing all these things into just five pillars at some level, that's going to break down. But when you get to that level, you're prepared to have a different conversation because people are more knowledgeable and, and, and want to go in a different direction. I, I think I'm okay with that. Hopefully you are too, yeah, Josh. Because, because of the audience that, that you were talking about, Matthew, um, and I'm sorry, I'm probably mangling your name, forgive me, but um, because you're saying this is a designed solely to simplify the information down to a level that uh, board members and high level executives can easily digest. It's palatable, it's understandable, and it's designed to, to take it and make it into a way so that we can justify a budget, justify measures that we need to take, and so on and so forth. Now I'm comfortable with that. Thank you for uh, indulging me. Yeah. And, you know, I think you, you, your point, some of the technical accuracy is, is a very fair point. The, the, the five pillars are, are not designed um, at capturing the, the, the full uh, technical accuracy. I think, as you rightly explained there, it, it's really getting people on board, getting them to sign off on a bu budget, but, but mostly getting them to sponsor the, the, the overall uh, security exercise and the comp compliance exercise. Because once that's in place, they're going to look at the CISO or they're going to look at the, the risk manager and say, OK, I get it now. We do take payments by credit card. I kind of understand that thing called PLI. And you'll say, no, no, it's not PLI. It's PCI. Yeah, whatever. What does that mean? And at that stage, you can say, well, actually, it means that we need to have firewalls in, in, in place. We need to have antivirus. We need to have uh, intrusion detection. We need to do a pen test. And at that stage, you 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 have their attention and you you know they they'll probably understand that you need a budget to to make all of that go away and and make sure that it's it's done on a regular basis um but, so whilst, sorry go ahead yeah i was i was going to ask matthew you know i was thinking about the the whole notion of simplification if you're talking to the board and you're talking to c level people uh, certainly at some point this conversation comes down to dollars and cents. And as you just mentioned, budget, I mean, isn't that the ultimate simplification is what do we need and how much is it going to cost? Yeah. Uh, so there are different models that you can link to the five pillars of security in terms of, um, you know, what, what is the, the compliance effort going to cost, uh, first time and then to maintain it and so on. There's also different models that have been published by various organizations um, in the US and in Europe, and in, in fact, in Australia as well, that kind of put a dollar amount to security in such a way that you can put that on your PL or balance sheets. And essentially, security becomes an asset and it comes. Um, and the ability to link a very high level view of your security posture using the five pillars of security and then linking that to, to a dollar amount is extremely powerful for, for a board. It's very powerful for the CSO or the security team or the compliance team because they can demonstrate the value add of, of being secure as opposed to just a, a cost. Um, it's also very good for a CFO because if they... If they find a way to essentially monetize security on the overall accounts of the business, um, that gives them um, a, a lot more room for, for essentially investing into the latest technologies, making sure that they, they employ the right folks and that they, they essentially right, get the right budgets in order to, to become secure and, and remain secure. So, hi, hi, Matthew. This is Scott. Uh, thank you for joining us today, by the way. Uh, I'm looking at your website, vigitrust.com slash pillars dash framework, right? So if anybody wants to see what we're talking about, you can go there. It's vigitrust.com slash pillars dash framework, okay? Now, I'm looking in here, and I like the way that you have this laid out, right? You're trying to make this really simple for people to understand. But the part that I want to key in on is that you're trying to tie each pillar to a set of stakeholders, a stakeholder, right, depending on the business structure. But you're taking it a step further than we've seen a lot of other uh, uh, paradigms try to approach, right? In that, 
we'll take data security, right? Data security in your pillars is defined by trade secrets, employee data, data, the database, and customer data. But you're saying that the responsibility for the data security lies with HR, IT teams, and managers, right? So I like the fact that you're trying to tie this into the organization itself, right? It's not just sitting back saying, well, C-levels and board members, you know, these are the five pillars that you need to worry about. You're trying to say these are the five pillars that you need to worry about. And here's who you need to go to to look into these pillars. Right. How did you guys come up with the tie ins down inside of the organization itself? What was your methodology behind it? So it's a great question. In fact, uh, the, the idea of the five pillars um is something that that came up when we were doing a, a, an assessment against the, the Data Protection Act to, for some some clients in um, in back in Ireland a few years ago. Um, we we had published a, a a document after doing an assessment on site and reviewing policies and procedures and interviewing a few people, and the executive summary that we'd written was clearly way too technical for whoever commissioned the work. And they kept asking us for something really simple. Uh, and and they, they mentioned, you know, physical security and data security. And that's really where the idea came from initially. Um, and when we produced the report, they were, we were saying, well, that's great. I can see where I'm secure f f from a physical perspective or data perspective and so on where I'm not. What I don't know is who can help me with, within my organization. So I'd like to point out that, you know, we're saying, for instance, data security is IT, HR, uh, data people, managers. These are just kind of guidelines. Obviously, it will depend on your organization. But um, I, I totally agree with you with, with the fact that if you provide people with guidance as to what is right and what is wrong, you also need to tell them who can help them. And in fact, the, the, the help that can help within a specific pillar might ironically need to come from a third party who then becomes an additional risk for your organization. And we identify that as well and when, when we use the, the five pillars. Okay. So okay. I, I, ahead, I guess Josh. my follow-up question to earlier. Oh, I'm sorry, Scott. Did, did you have something else? No, yep, you're all clear. Go for it. Um, so you, you've designed this to be a, a communications tool to communicate to executives, to communicate to board members, to, to make them understand in ways that is uh, uh, palatable and, and comfortable for them. Uh, does that sound about right? Um, yes. That's, and yeah. my question is, is there a corresponding five pillars or eight pillars so you can turn around and say, okay, technical people, here's your version. Yeah, so well, there's, there's 12 we've, pillars we've in PCI. Done, yeah, so we, we've done mappings between the five pillars and PCI. We've done mappings between the five pillars and GDPR. We've done mappings between five pillars and HEPA perspective, obviously, because we've already uh, spoken about the, the, the challenge with regards to, to technical accuracy. But for instance, right. it, it, you, you can say if you've done your assessment on the five pillars using the initially the strategic with 25 questions and then the sorry the super strategic with 25 questions and then the strategic version with 60 questions, you end up with a risk level as well as red flag questions. Uh, for instance, you might get a good risk level of uh, I don't know you're 80 percent good, but within all of that you still have two red flag questions which basically means that you fail on some key things for your industry, for instance. Um, and then we take all of this and we, we just say, well, what does that mean in terms of a, a GDPR compliance uh, efforts? And so we, we've done all of those mappings. Um, I would like to point out, though, that in, in, in complete transparency, uh, and, and it's the same for every mapping that you find in the industry, uh, whether it's an official mapping or not, they are subjective, right? Because they really depend on your uh, on your own environment. But you're yeah. right. Once the, the board has been educated, they need to be able to translate all of that into operational and technical security and, and, and compliance frameworks. Um, so um, we need to have that link between um, a, a, an overview based on the five pillars 
and then MISP, and then ISO, and then GDPR, and so on. And this is all work in yeah, progress. And obviously, uh, as the both frameworks themselves evolve, uh, for instance, we have PCI version 4 coming out, uh, we're going to be revising our mapping from the 12 pillars to PCI. No, it's perfect. It's perfect. Thank you. A lot, okay, of, so, lot of anticipation with PCI 4. You got a final question, Scott, and then I'll wrap I, up. I, I do. I do. Um, Matthew, in... On on your site, right, one of the check marks down near the bottom that says, uh, from a legal perspective, you've got a host of new regulations and standards such as privacy in the U.S. and GDPR in Europe. How can a uh, legal uh, a legal individual, right, uh, understand from this framework where the company that's using it? is defined as in risk, right? I, I know the simple answer is, well, gee, Scott, read the report, right? I get that, right? But <clears throat> legal people are not going to sit back and say, well, I have time to read a 40, you know, 60, even a six-page report, right? How do you fast-track the pillars for legal? Yeah, so um, legal people are very interesting people. They, you know, they, they love to say that the answer depends. You know, if you ask a solicitor or a lawyer, uh, am I in compliance or not? It, the, the answer will probably be, it depends. And so they kind of, to, in, in an ironic way, they kind of understand that not everything is a zero or one or, or a, a yes or no. Uh, what we do for them is we, that as a result of the, the assessment on, on the five pillars, we're able to say, well, you know, based on, on your results, on your assessments, uh, we can already tell you that you won't be in compliance with PCI or you won't be in compliance with GDPR because Article 39 of GDPR is requiring you to have XYZ and then requirement um, 12 that, that uh, two of, of, of PCI is requiring you to have that policy. And so that's something that we can relate to, um, especially if you can give them a checklist of, of items that they can go back to and they can say, actually, it, I, can, I, I look at it now and I can see that that would, me, that would put me out of compliance. Um, also, uh, I don't want to put all, of, uh, all legal people in, in the same basket, so to speak. Some of them are very technically minded and others are more like policy minded. And, and again, I go back to the idea, the original intent of, of, of the five pillars, which is to kind of have a common framework, even for large organizations that might have a full legal team, they may use the framework to have the, the technically minded legal people understand what the policy people want to do. Because we see that as well, especially in very large super enterprises that are very common in, in the US where within the legal team itself, you'll have some folks that are totally focused on, on technical stuff and others totally on policy, and they, they themselves don't speak the same language. So the, the, the framework can be used to address that, that gap as well. Okay, thank you. And so leading into the next question, and I tr trust me, it's the last question I'm going to ask, right? Um, is keeping with the legal theme, okay, First part of my last question is, has anybody that has used your service, have they have they suffered from, from a breach? And then the second one is, has legal used the five pillars to an effective status to say, yes, we did our due diligence, here's how you can tell? So in, in terms of the breach question, you know, we help companies um, that have been breached. Uh, we've also, uh, obviously, we have... You know, we have in excess of 3,000 clients. So um, if you if you listen to anyone at RSA, they'll tell you that there's only two types of companies uh, in terms of, of the breach, those that know that have been breached and those that don't. Mm -hmm. um, so that probably answers that question. In, in terms of the in terms of the, the validity of the uh, of the framework for the legal team to be able to say, hey, I use the five pillars of security. So that demonstrates that that's not the intent of the, uh, of the five pillars. The intent is really to, so that they can make informed and intelligent decisions as to where to budgets and people 
being sponsored by C-level folks and by the board. Um, so I, I, I have not seen a, a legal counsel waive a, a report based on the five pillars, whether it's done by one of our partners using it or whether it's done using our software saying, hey, I've used the five pillars, so therefore I am legally compliant. Because that's not really the intent, you know. Right, right. So what you're saying is, is that the five pillars is more of a framework for uh, uh, governance inside of the organization. And then on top of that governance are the compliance sets like GDPR, CCPA, PCI, so on and so forth, right? That's correct. Having said that, we have seen an, a good number of clients going to the regulators like the, the data protection authorities in Europe um, or going to uh, acquiring banks or to the, the brands from, a, VZ, from a, a PCI perspective saying we've used the five pillars our, as our initial risk assessment tool. And then based on that, we focus uh, okay. on that okay. area or that area. Okay, yeah. See, that that right there is the initial foray into what a company needs to do. That makes sense. So, you know, really the question for me should not have been, has it been used in defense of, but how have you precursored prior to putting up a defense that legal th can then use? So, yep. yeah. That, yeah, right. so to, to that point, if, if it, from a European perspective, if the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner in Ireland or the ICO in the UK or the CNIL in France knocks at your door and says to the managing director or the CEO or whoever is the most senior person in the office that day, can you tell me about how you protect data? Can you tell me about your cybersecurity strategy? At a click of a button, they can say, I'm not technically minded, but I can show you what we're doing as a management team. And I can show you that we have a strategy and that strategy is based on five key things that we all understand um, in terms of key decision makers. So at least the regulator will be satisfied that there's a program in place, that they take it seriously, and that it, it's actually a, a comprehensive and intelligent program that I've been that has been uh, produced by people that, that speak a common language and therefore they have a better chance of protecting the data. Mm -hmm. That's super, Matthew. Hey, I apologize. Our time is up. It, it seems like every time we have one of these interviews, we could keep going and going. Uh, really want to thank you, Matthew, for your time today. It's been a, a good discussion, uh, a lively discussion, and, and, and almost controversial at some point, which I think is something we're aiming for. But uh, hopefully you'll come back again sometime and uh, and we can talk more at length. But for now, thank you. And we're going to take a quick break and come back and talk about security and compliance news. <laughs>